Hey, Mikael Long Amber. Welcome back to PCM 23 Lions, episode 55. It's our signing special. We're right into August the 1st. I've already made two signings, two no-brainer re-signs. First in Bosco, because we need to develop our sprint program, and there's just not much in terms of options in Africa. So as one of the best options, re-signing Bosco for 3K was super simple, easy decision. Easy decision, not as cheap as I was hoping, but Hanok has also been re-signed. So Hanok, at four stars, four and a half star potential, is one of the best riders within the program. Got a ways to go on his development yet. He might just break into a five star kind of category. He did cost a little bit more at 8K, but we've got him signed up long term with plenty more to come from him. Following that, the retention of current riders is gonna come down to some choices. In all, we had seven expiring contracts. One I've already decided to let go. That's Umerera. Umerera uh, was one of those busts. We've had maybe three of them come through this series so far, where the scouting did not match up to the actual rider once we got him. So very easy decision there, he's gone. But the other six are all writers that I would more or less like to hang on to. I'd like to keep. Now, the one I want to keep the most is not because he's the best, but because he has the best overall rating and does provide us something that a lot of other writers do not. That's Kareem. And I think I'm going to go with Kareem next. For one thing, he comes from one of the lesser nations of Africa, giving him a chance to boost that nation at some point if he can grab a result. But Kareem is, he's just a domestique. He's just a glorified domestique. But what he does for us with 71 cobbles gives us something that we don't have in other areas. He can time trial, so he's useful to a team. But he's such a weak climber. He does have 69 hill rating, but he's not a sprinter. But for us, the biggest thing, of course, is his flat rating at a 78. Far superior to anybody else on the team. Still has maybe a point or two left in that where he could give us that little bit more just a little bit but with a far superior flat rating he's a fantastic lead out guy not the last lead out not you know your sprints about to happen but in those final kilometers getting to the front holding position at the front is something we just could not do when i eventually kind of gave up on the sprint temporarily kareem is getting us back to the front where we couldn't before. He's getting us ahead of everybody else. Our guys are not exhausted because we're not having to sprint from 4K out because literally no one is positioned and you have to get positioned and we've still got three riders at the helm and we don't have any of them that are quick. He's fast enough. He gets us to the front. Finally, we finally have somebody who can do that. I don't want to lose him, but that's all he's got. A flat rating it's not terribly valuable as far as things go. I don't want to be spending big time money on him. Let's see what he costs. 8K? Doesn't like the teammate rule, but let's see what happens if we make him an important writer. Uh, let's see if we can offer him a little bit less. And it's somebody I want to have on the team. So if we can lock him down, we're going to lock him down three years. Oh, so close. Okay, 8-4. Well, makes it 400 more than Henoke. Technically, he is better by a full half star he is amongst our best riders we don't want to risk losing position i'm not sure if he's our top three in ratings anymore but there you go 8.4 to keep kareem and for now that makes our state of affairs simple seven expiring three signed that's a minus four at the moment that's the minimum we're going to look to sign maybe six more to expand the roster a little bit further. But what about the finances? We started with a pretty healthy amount, 47,000. We're still at 28K. So we've got plenty of money. We're gonna be looking at minimum contracts or close to minimum contracts the rest of the way. It all gets smaller from here. Bitsy Mana, Burhi, most likely to ask a little bit more, five, six K, four K. And they're in jeopardy because they really aren't that good and they're not going to get that much better. 
but they're okay and they still have some potential so it's it's kind of tricky but there are better options available in the developing talents category so i think before we bother with Abitsimana, Burhi, or Arangana, again, all three I'd like to have, but I might be more willing to take others on than them. So first off, uh, we're going to take Haptum, air train rider. Great web here on the potential. He's got a ways to go yet, but at two and a half already, 18 should develop pretty fast and, and get to be to the level of Berkey, of Bitsy Mana, pretty quickly, and has far better potential than either of them. Uh, I'm wondering if I should take some of these on the one-year type deals, and then to eventually turn that into four-year type deals. All right, one-year deal for Habdom. Oliver Clout has big-time potential. Already 21, already somewhat developed. Three stars. 70 for the mountains. This is one of those ones that I'm not entirely sure though because I would have seen him in the last couple of years and didn't. Didn't see this possibility. Didn't see a five and a half star climber. So has it changed? Did we miss him? Not sure how we came to this, but let's get this guy signed up. He's already near the level of those two, but he's already gone through some levels, so he's not going to be too rapid on his development. But this is an all around kind of racer can be very helpful to the team. And having him signed on minimum is awesome. Unlike the other, this is definitely three-year deal territory. He's already a three-star prospect. Next up, the best sprinting prospect we have seen. Period. That's it. Best we've seen. No one has been better. Five and a half star sprinter. Already a 72. Already a 71 flat. 19 years of age. Already three stars. He'll be rapid a similar mold coming up next where they can both climb and are punchy and not terribly rated in kind of the other areas where they're decently well-rounded just about all rounders at this point i've spent 10 of the 28k we had remaining on four riders minimum contracts one of them on a one-year deal the others on three-year deals so four prospects high-end prospects better than the guys that have expiring contracts other than Hanok is similar in in the mold to those riders after that i'm down to literally one last potential prospect and that's this guy bar bari the tunisian bari is a two and a half four and a half potential five star puncher is is his primary but realistically we're looking at a decent all-arounder not a great climber He'll have okay time trialing, so he could be useful in a team time trial. He has an okay cobble rating and an okay sprint. But what all does he really give us other than being a potential puncher climber? Uh, cobble puncher, sorry. 69 hills already, but only a 59 cobble rating right now. He's far from anything that he will become other than right now he does show up as a decent puncher with a 69 acceleration and that 69 hills rating other than him i'm now down to the potential re-signing of our three guys seven signed seven outgoing so any additional signings we do will be expanding the roster and putting more strain on the budget so we have to think carefully at this point. So the first guy, Adangana, three and a half star current, three and a half star potential. He has a lot of room to grow as a puncher, but he's only got a 63 hills rating. 72 mountain, 72 medium mountain, 70 stamina is not great. And there's really not a lot left in his growth in that area. I think we can probably let him go. I think. Bari's probably a better prospect than he is. So next up to evaluate is Burhi. Now Burhi's greatest strength probably is that he's Ethiopian, but it's not a 1-1 nation. It is a 3-2 nation. So for him to grab wins, it's going to take something pretty big 
to grow Ethiopia uh, from him. But he's been a decent servant for us. But at 72 mountain, 74 medium mountain, 76 hills, 73 acceleration, he's an okay puncher. And there's still a little room for progress in his web. He's been with us for quite a few seasons. He's got two total wins. He was with Jaco Alula at the beginning of this, three years with them before coming to us. He's picked up three victories with us, even though it only shows two at the top. But he's definitely become a less important piece to what we're doing. He's added a mountain point. He's added a hills point this year. But his progression is pretty slow. He's already 26. I think we're going to be calling it quits with this third and final year. Seems like uh, a good time to part ways. He's somebody who has helped us get to where we're at. But to get to the next step, there's a wave of prospects that are coming in that are bigger and better than the guys we have. And this is that slow changeover from these guys to those guys. The only thing is we're going to miss, at least temporarily, Burhi as a good support climber. But a guy like Henoke is coming along fast enough to replace him, take over the role he played. He's not a leader for us. Hasn't been for a while. Now he's just a sport climber. The sport climbers, they'll come along quickly. So that leaves me with uh, Bitsimana. Bitsimana is almost right there with Burhi. I mean, very similarly rated. 70 mountain instead of a 72, but 74 medium mountains the same. 76 hills is the same. A little bit better time trialist. Stamina is very similar. Recovery is similar similar accelerations a couple points lower good downhill but then what about the prospect how much better is he going to get the answer is not a lot better and that brings me back to Bari 18 year old prospect puncher looks like he'll be better than either of those two eventually not a better climber, though. But that cobble rating, that sprint rating, that combination, hills, cobble, sprint, that that could score a win somewhere, somehow. Barador means he's going to have a good flat rating. Maybe. <laughs> Usually. But between sprint and Barador, it means he should have a good flat rating. That could also be useful for us. Right? More than one guy besides Kareem who can... Help set up a sprint. Not a great prospect. Really not. And Tunisia is a 3-3 nation. So it's... You could expect more. But we have some money to throw at this. But this is the one that I'm iffy on. So instead of signing him to a three-year deal and being locked in, we're going to go ahead and just sign him to a one-year deal. This is going to expand the roster by a single writer for a minimal cost and if I don't like him, he's gone in a year. New team profile for the upcoming year is unchanged. The guys that we're losing weren't big enough to affect the profile of the web. The guys we're replacing them with are younger, better prospects. But overall, we're, we're going to get slightly worse. I mean, I am letting three decent writers go. Four, five bigger prospects. Long term, it's going to help us out. Short term, might hurt us a little bit next year in terms of our depth, but I think our growth of the prospects we have now plus the new prospects will make up for it. I think we'll be in the same boat next season that we're in right now. Here's the issue. In terms of our placement right now, index-wise, we're 22nd. That's great, but we were higher than that last year at the start of affairs. We knew we weren't going to stay, but eventually we fell to almost missing Continental Pro cutoff. We've not gotten better. Samuels is the same writer he was a year ago. No change. De Villiers is the same writer he was a year ago. No change. Rotesier was our third best. He is still a four and a half star guy. He's leveled up a little bit. So we've gotten better. 
on average by a tenth, two tenths, we have not progressed significantly. The database does, season by season. So I fear our position may take somebody leveling up. The good news is we have a lot of guys here, but Johannes Stalik, Kareem, Shimwe, they've already leveled up. I think right now we're looking at De Villiers to be that guy. Uh, maybe he's, I mean, or Samuels, the you know, 23, 22 years of age. We've definitely completed the move to go young. LeBron at 28 is the old man now. We're letting Burhi go, who's 26. So we're literally down to just one elder statesman here at the team. We've been doing just fine with 24 riders this season. I think we'll do just fine with 25 next season. I don't think it's going to change anything significantly, having one more rider. We still have that little bit of leftover cash that can feed into whatever budget for next season. We didn't have any major re-signings this year. We had two guys at 8, 8.5K and almost minimum contracts across the board otherwise. That part is good business. There is some quality. One of our top riders, one of our top five riders, was among those who we had to sign a deal on. Hinoke is also the top four-star guy on the verge of being a four-and-a-half-star guy. Plenty of potential left, and they're signed up long-term. We could see Hinoak reach four and a half stars very soon. So for all of that, I think it's good business, but it's not amazing. We're not looking at any six star prospects, but a bunch of five star prospects. I mean, we have one Samuels, one clear leader, one clear writer that when we throw all in to support him, he can do something. Imagine what it's going to be like when we have six Samuels and how effective that's going to make us. And especially if it's not just climbers. I mean, Imagine what our GC capabilities would be like if we had six Mason Samuels. I don't know if we're winning a grand tour like that still, because you really, really got to be elite. But we could do fairly well in a lot of races, a lot of races on the calendar. That's still not enough to get you a world tour, though. So it is going to take something more. It is going to take some development. But that's why this season, the focus has been to race all of those pro races, because they have a higher points value. Why do you want the higher points? Because if we finish at the top, or top three really, of the Continental Pro rankings at the end of the season, the rankings matter for one thing, one thing only. If you finish in that top three, you are guaranteed a certain level of invites, whether it be classics, whether it be stage races, that's gonna be a little bit determined by your position. But if you're in one of those top three, especially top two positions, you are going to get yeses to the races you request for a world tour in the following season that is our ticket that is our pathway to get to the world tour races to get the wins to boost the nations because winning pro races with one one nations didn't trigger it we know that a big race win would would force it we've discovered that this year they've changed it and it's not automatic trigger points and it's not so easy to build a nation, to build a continent. It's harder. It's a lot harder than it was last year. But those World Tour victories, they're going to increase the odds significantly. They're also going to give us the points to keep us established as that Continental Pro team. And if we don't start developing nations, we're going to find ourselves right back in Continental. We could be in Continental next season again. But we got to try something now. Now, if we go back down to Continental, then it's obvious, obvious that we start speeding through seasons again. But this is our pathway to a world tour race calendar while being a small Continental Pro team. That's the objective short term. We're at the World Championships, just gone under 100K remaining in this lengthy one. There's a lot of climbing to get through here. And the two riders for South Africa... Here at this World Championships, where are we? Bergen, Norway. Uh, the the two riders here are my two riders. Uh, I did have a couple other choices, Debod for one, but I needed somebody who could handle this climb to set up a sprinter. The best sprinter in South Africa is De Villiers, and Samuels is the best climber. In South Africa, he's also 
within a point of best flat rating comparatively to everybody else. He's also the best stamina compared to everybody else. So there are the two that I picked. There is a better lead out sprinter, but I was worried about the climb being a bit too much. Breakaway down to three and a half minutes, just three riders in it, 143 in the peloton chasing nations of the world, trying to make things happen. So far, so good for us. We're going to have to get water one final time for Samuels here. Uh, not much fatigue. There was a fight early on on establishing the breakaway, and our two guys didn't fare too well through that period, but things lightened up and have been pretty easy going since. I imagine, though, it's about to get a lot harder. Samuels goes down. And here is that huge acceleration, too. And Samuels lost contact there. So the field is splitting. Samuels trying to get it back up into position. He's got good race day condition. De Villiers does not. De Villiers now riding solo is going to have to work a little bit harder without that support. Samuels is nearly back in position and is. Okay. Dodged a bullet there. That could have been bad. Still three and a half minutes to the front guys, though. Gap is not coming down to them currently, but the pace is a lot higher. Definitely enough undulation here to create uh, issues. The gap is coming down, 245. 43k left, De Villiers starting to feel it. The minus two to stamina and resistance definitely hurting him. His sprint is unaffected, but his climb ratings are bad. His flat rating is just okay. So he has been struggling through this, and we're going to have to uh, really put his foot down for these last two climbs to try to hold position up to an 87. Let's see how that does. This is just the climb before the climb. And now we're climbing. 2K is the climb. It's about 6%. So it's not super long, but it's just the constant and the recovery is very short. Huge acceleration. We make it over the top of that one into the recovery of the descent. Brief, but position hurting. Slowly recovering it. There you go. One minute to the breakaway. 26k. He might just make it to the end to... Uh, partake in the sprint, but here goes some of the favorites trying to attack. Better hills rating at least for De Villiers. We'll kind of push up to that here shortly. There you go. 95. Big acceleration. Attack fails. It's neutralized immediately. Breakaway's been caught. Final climb. Watch that energy drain. Watch those front riders put this thing under pressure. And the group is starting to split. 120. We're going to make it over the top. Yes, we are. 106. 11k to go. Little recovery will help us. Samuels will be able to lead this out. He's doing a little bit better energy-wise, but De Villiers is the better sprinter and does have enough. And the field has split, and it's 50. 45. 6K. Okay. We're in position. How many sprinters are left? Okay. Gel. And... Gel. And... Here we go. Samuel's obviously to the front. Let's try not a 99. Let's see what a 96 will do for us. Foot down. Improve the position. De Villiers. Gotta go with him, bud. Gotta go with him. There's some space. 2.4. Okay, full 99. 1.9. Fairly well positioned. Not a lot of red bar, though. 1K, De Villiers. Can he get a top 10? He will not get a top 10. He's out of red bar. He's out of energy entirely. Samuels is going to catch back up to him. Jake Stewart has taken the win. Henry Bond second. It's a UK 1-2. Phillipson 
Milan and Ewan and De Villiers fade. Samuels, he, he was a couple bike links ahead and Samuels comes back, does not overtake him at the line. They both finish in the top 25. That's uh, okay, but we were hoping for more. That came down to that minus two, though. Really did. We protected him. We set him up well. But he faded so fast in that sprint, in that final kilometer. He just could not hang. And that's all those reds. All those reds to his attribute. On to the time trial. And Stefan Debod has gotten the nod for this one. I think an 82 is probably a bit hard once we get him settled in, though, and get him up to speed, which he's there now. Uh, we'll bring it down to about a 78. Yellow bar mattering the most, except for on the climb at the end for this individual time trial at the World Championships. Yeah, even that 78 seems to be too much, too fast. He's not keeping up with that. Debod's only a 72 time trialist. Carolus from our team nearly got the selection. He was the other one, but he's a little bit weaker as a climber and a little bit weaker as a time trialist. And Debod, at least he's set up for this. Uh, 75 Mountain today, 75 Time Trial today, 77 Stamina today, all helping him out a little bit. 78 was definitely too hard. 76 seems to be fairly neutral. We're making good ground on this rider ahead of us. Wow, that art's already at the top of the standings ahead of Sobrero and Coleman. And we have 16k to go. The 76 seems to be making up ground, and we're Cerny is pretty decent. Check rider. It's a good time trial. So we're third at the first time check. All right, I think by the time we reach the climb, we'll have a positive because we seem to be just a little bit the right side of things on a 76. The 78, it was a little hard. The 76 seems to be making up just a little bit of ground. We went a little deeper on that portion of the climb, though. We're gonna have to back off a little more. Let's try a 75 here. About to hit the climb. Not a great climber, so he's gonna lose time, but he's been kind of consistent. The time trial and the climbing are the same. I don't think we're gonna be particularly high placed here, but we only get one rider. We only get one shot at it, and he's nearly out of energy with still over a K to go, which means we gotta back off even more to get there. He's going to lose a lot of time. Yeah, here comes Cerny coming back at him. Oh, he's out. Out of energy. Out of energy. Loses a little more ground there. Overall, though, not too bad. 27th, 350 down. Brandon Jones, who doesn't even have a team, has put in the 8th best for the UK. Well, Vedart, is he going to win it, or will it be somebody else? There shouldn't be too many riders left. Uh, we are a very minor nation, so we're at the end of the list, but you're down to the lead rider of all these teams. Now, I suspect we're going to drop a fair bit. I mean, we're at 31st already. 32nd. Rider after rider. Here's Roglic. 32nd for him, Van Dyke. Bitziger, a time trialist, but not a great climber. Foss, definitely a bit better. Fourth for Foss. Cavagna, Almeida, 6th, Vingegaard, 31st, wow, did not come in ready for this race, did he? Ayuso, 12th, Avenapol goes 2nd, wow, Venart claims a win, it's a Belgian 1-2-3, Faze takes 3rd, uh, Foss ended up 5th, Sobrero fell to 4th, Asgreen came in late, 6th, Almeida 7th, Cavagna, Coleman, and Reynolds, we were a bit off the pace. Stefan Abad never looked to actually compete for anything. We were good at the first time check. Maybe we went a little too hard, though, if we were that good at the first time check. Based on our ratings, we suffered for it at the very, very end on the climb. Uh, I knew I'd gone a little too hard. I had backed off, and I was certainly going the right direction with backing off, but we were still just a hair too hard. And if we'd started on a 76... We might have made it a bit further up that climb or not run out there that last little bit. We would have lost a little less time, but not significantly less time. We would have lost 20 seconds fewer, maybe. But, you know, there's, there's big 
gaps here. Debod 315 down. Maybe it would have been 250. We would have been with Kwiatkowski. <clears throat> All right, folks. Well, that's going to do it for this episode. There wasn't points on offer here anyway. Back to our pro races to wrap up the year to assure our position as one of the top teams. And in the meantime, keep an eye on our fall down the order and hope that we hang on to Continental Pro for the coming season. That's going to do it for this episode. I'm Kathleen Gamer. Like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Have a good one. Be safe out there. Bye for now.